Dana White's life is a non-stop cavalcade of madness. He runs a $4 billion company in the most volatile sport in the world, where major events that take months to plan can change in less than a day. He has to keep Twitter goofs with five followers in line when they say something he doesn't like. And come Christmas time, he's gotta have snow imported to his Las Vegas driveway, because what the hell else are you going to do with $500 million? But as wild as Uncle Dana's day-to-day -day is, there are some moments that stand out as even more ridiculous than the rest even more absurd than the crazy that DFW is used to. And today, we're going to count down 10 of the most ludicrous things to ever happen to the UFC president. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are 10 insane moments in Dana White's life. Number 10. Dana Really Carries Floyd's Bags a few months before the Floyd Mayweather Conor McGregor boxing match became official and froze over hell permanently, Floyd Mayweather famously went off on Dana White about their past, claiming that the UFC president used to carry his bags. And while Floyd isn't the most reliable of narrators, in this instance he's telling the truth. Back when Dana first showed up in Las Vegas as an adult, and we'll get to why he came to Vegas in the first place a bit later, White was looking to make a name for himself in the boxing scene and hooked up with the Mayweather's gym in order to get his foot in the door. White wasn't a fighter, but a trainer and a would-be manager and promoter. In addition to doing everything he could for the Mayweather camp, Dana started a boxing equipment apparel line called Bull and & Bicer, and was even able to get the up-and-coming Mayweather Jr. to rock his gear in his first-ever professional fight against Roberto Apodaca. Of course, nobody is repping Bull and Bicer today since White moved on to running the UFC, but his brief time on the ground floor with boxing's most successful fighter would make for a hell of a story 20 plus years later when the guy carrying his bags would co-promote the second biggest boxing match ever. Number 9. A Missing Shoe Gets Dana Expelled Dana White bumped around the country in his youth, but one of the most important places he would end up was Bishop Gorman High School in Las Vegas, Nevada, where he would meet a young Lorenzo Fertitta and form a friendship that would eventually lead to them buying the UFC. The fate of the world's biggest MMA promotion was almost sealed in the late 80s, though, when Dana got into a bit of hot water at the private Catholic high school. As Dana tells the story, a story he apparently hates but Lorenzo thinks is just the greatest, the Bishop Gorman they attended wasn't exactly cutting edge. Their AC didn't even work. So when Vegas got hot in the summer, the school would open the large metal doors to the building in order to get some airflow. Being that Dana was a stupid ass teenager, one day on the way to class, he decided to kick one of those heavy doors closed because he was a stupid ass teenager. The noise was so loud that a nun teaching in a classroom nearby went aggro to the point where she couldn't even teach her lesson. The students in that class encouraged Dwight to continue his door kicking ways so they would never have to learn anything ever again. One day, White was doing his thing to ruin that nun's life when his shoe got caught up in the act and went flying into the air. A shoeless White booked it the hell out of there, but the nun now had the evidence she needed to name her tormentor. White was eventually nabbed as the culprit as he was the only kid walking around school with one fucking shoe on, and so he was expelled, ending his time with Lorenzo. It was only a chance encounter at a wedding years later that would reunite the two, but an errant shoe almost ruined MMA for us all. I lost my shoe. Number 8. Dana White, Celebrity Boxing Trainer one of the things that Dana White got into while trying to take over the boxing business when he arrived in Las Vegas as an adult was training white-collar folks to box sans the whole head trauma thing. Ow, my lucky face! It was low risk, and you got to learn how to throw a left hook and get a good sweat in. Business was popping for White, and it would eventually create the opportunity to live with Mark Wahlberg in Los Angeles and teach the actor how to box for an upcoming movie about the life of Vinnie Curto. Dana trained Marky Mark for three months in preparation for the lead role, and one day the film's co-star, Bobby De Niro, who would be playing boxing trainer Angelo Dundee, showed up with Angelo Dundee and they all had a sit-down. Mid-meeting, Mark pulled Dana aside to let him know he was freaking De Niro out. Out, and if he couldn't get it together, he was going to have to leave the room. Apparently, White was just blankly staring at the Goodfellas star the entire meeting because it was Robert fucking De Niro. I mean, come on. Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, Casino, The Deer Hunter, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Anyway, the movie lost funding and was never made, and Dana went back to Vegas. Number 7. Dana Gets Jumped and Meniere's Disease when the UFC president was just 21 years old and bar hopping in Boston, he ran into a group of guys who apparently weren't too big on him being alive anymore. Because according to White, several men beat the shit out of him for more than 20 minutes outside of a bar until police arrived. 
One guy in particular punched Dana in the left ear, quote, like a thousand times. Not sure why that guy was so big on ear punches. It hit me in the ear. But nonetheless, Dana suffered permanent hearing loss as a result and would eventually suffer nerve damage due to the attack, which gave White Meniere's disease, a neurological condition that caused the perception of the room spinning so severely that it would force Dana to lie on the ground with his eyes closed in a dark room for up to nine hours each time it would flare up. After getting a surgery that fixes 70% of patients with the condition and requires you to have your ear cut off and then reattached, White was still having attacks. That was until he was saved by Alex Rodriguez of the New York Yankees, who was like, hey Dana, go to Germany. They got this shit there that fixed my knee in like a week. So Dana went to Germany, they took a whole bunch of his blood, spun it around, stuck him with a big ass needle full of yellow shit, and now the UFC president is completely free of the disease. Science, you know. A huge thank you to A-Rod and Germany. Number 6. Dana's daughter gets her ear ripped off mid-UFC show. Not sure what it is about Dana's family and ear trauma, but mid-card UFC 192 back in 2015, Dana White gets a call from his wife, but it wasn't to ask him how work was going. It was to incomprehensibly scream about the fact that their family dog had just ripped their nine-year-old daughter's fucking ear off. That's not a call you get every day. Dana's daughter had an ice cream cone that the dog wanted, but the little one wasn't having it and told the dog no, which triggered the attack. A horrifying situation and one Dana was having to deal with 1,500 miles away in Houston in Texas. White immediately sprang into action though, and if there's any doctors in the world that know how to deal with trauma to the face and head, it's the UFC's doctors. So Dana asked their guy what they should do besides the obvious of getting his daughter to an emergency room immediately, and the UFC doc arranged for his daughter to be seen by a plastic surgeon, not simply just any kind of doctor. These gloves came free with my toilet brush. They were apparently able to reattach her ear so perfectly that you would never know anything had happened. And it sounds like her hearing is just fine too. White told the story to Joe Rogan on his podcast, and as you may know, Joe is particularly fascinated by the animal kingdom. And I think a grizzly can outrun a chimp. And specifically their ability to rip people's shit up. So he was awestruck by the tail. When asked about the fate of the dog, White went full mob boss stating simply, the dog's gone. The dog's gone. Number five. Dana breaks Vegas and gets banned. When on the rare occasion that people like you or I go to a casino and win a few hands more than we lose, we leave with maybe a couple hundred more dollars in our pocket than we came in with. But when someone who has as much money as Dana White gets on a heater, the results for the casino can be disastrous. Dana White loves blackjack. He loves blackjack about as much as he loves anything. He once told Barstool Sports that he wanted his family to bury him with a trophy he won from a blackjack tournament against professional players. White is apparently so good at winning big in the game game of 21, that he's been barred from several casinos on the Strip, the most prominent being the Palms. Back in 2012, White took the casino for one and a half million dollars, and when the location sold, the new owners told him they were done with that bullshit. White was not happy with the ban, and apparently said the UFC would no longer hold events at the Palms, but another set of owners would come around a few years after the ban and invite Dana back in, because casinos love them some whales. Unfortunately, this backfired on the new management too, and Dana took the casino for nearly two million at blackjack for a second time, prompting them to ban him again. But this time to play up to his ego, the owners gave White a championship belt for his troubles, which he proudly displays in his office to this day. The Fertitas are now the owners of the Palms, so I don't think Dana will be asked to leave anymore. Number four, Dana versus Japanese gangsters. There has been a lot of speculation over the years that the UFC never really intended to keep Pride alive in Japan after the promotion was acquired back in 2007. But documents from the ongoing UFC antitrust lawsuit show that Pride head Nobuyuki Sakikabara signed a $10 million seven-year non-compete contract, so it would appear that Zufa very much had the intention of taking over the Japanese market. Of course, that didn't happen, nor did any other Pride events, and the UFC wouldn't return to Japan as a promotion for another five years. So what the the hell happened. Part of it was the unexpected issues that arose from the initial illegal contracts held by Pride, and another huge factor was the Japanese organized crime syndicate known as the Yakuza. The Japanese mob had their hands in nearly all entertainment in the country, and it was their connections to Pride FC that caused the collapse of the company in the first place. Dana White has never played well with others. He wouldn't even co-promote with M1 to get Fedor, so he damn sure wasn't going to let some gangsters try to muscle in on his business simply for his own safety. There are stories that 
that Dana was directly threatened by the Yakuza during this transitional period, and that White would have to travel in the country with heavy security. At first, he was defiant, even saying that he would have to be killed to keep him out of Japan. But as we know, Zufa did let the Japanese market go, and Dana has said in many interviews since that the reason things didn't work out is because the Yakuza simply made it too hard to do business in the region. Number 3. The Irish Mob Pushed Dana Out of Boston from one mafia to another, we've mentioned several times on this list that Dana White returned to Las Vegas as an adult, but the reason he left Boston in the first place was the notorious mobster Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang. Remember that white-collar boxing exercise business that Dana was doing when he first went back to Las Vegas? Well, he started that in Boston, and business was a boomin'. Considering he was making good money, the Irish mob, which was prominent in the area, decided to move in on the successful entrepreneur's business with a classic shakedown. One day, while teaching class, two guys approached White about $2,500 he owed to the Winter Hill Gang. And like a child who pulls the sheets over their head at night, Dana figured if I don't see them, then they're not here. So after the two men left, White did absolutely nothing to take care of the bogus debt. Sometime later, he got a phone call letting him know that some associates of the mob boss Whitey Bulger would be there the next day to collect on the cash. Instead of using what money he had to pay off the gangsters, White uprooted his entire life and was on a plane to Las Vegas that very day. Dana had already made up his mind that he was going to take over the boxing game, so leaving everything at the drop of a hat to head to the fight capital of the world wasn't as terrifying a transition as it might seem. It beats sleeping with the fishes. Number 2. The Secret Hotel Fight Club in Dana's late teens and early 20s, while he was still figuring out what he wanted to do with his life, he worked odd jobs like any other young person does. But what Dana organized while he was a bellhop at a Four Seasons in Boston was definitely a sign of things to come. Hotel staff members expect tips if you haven't seen Home Alone 2 before, and as such, disputes over those tips with co-workers can often lead to conflict. Conflict that is best solved with organized violence. White, who saw a need and simply filled it, would gather co-workers that had issues with each other in a staff closet and let them beat the shit out of each other until everybody was friends again. Now, this wasn't a Motel 6, this was a high-class establishment, so the rules were simple, body blows only. After all, guests might complain if the hematoma on your forehead starts to bleed all over their luggage. White continued to oversee the Bellhop Fight Club until one day he just walked out of the building and decided that boxing was going to be the rest of his life. He was wrong, but not too far off, and his early days of fight promotion in a broom closet at the Four Seasons showed that even at a young age, Dana was on the right track. Number 1. Dana vs. Tito in Midair the long and storied beef between Tito Ortiz and Dana White has been well documented over the years and is as complex and incomprehensible at times as the Montagues versus the Capulets. At one point, the two were even scheduled to fight in a boxing match to settle their differences, but while that fight fell apart, another fight took place at some point in the early 2000s and was revealed for the first time ever by White in 2017 while appearing on the Conan O'Brien show. Dana, the Fertitas, and Joe Silva were accompanied by the Huntington Beach bad boy on a flight to Japan that was just taking off. When you're rich and have a private jet, you can apparently do whatever the fuck you want during takeoff, because it was at this point White says that he and Tito were horsing around. Once Ortiz got White in a neck crank though, shit got real fast. White began to tap, but Ortiz pulled a full Paul Harris and refused to let go of the hold. Dana started throwing shots to Tito's ribs, and when both men got to their feet, a fist fight ensued that according to Dana, was shaking taking the small plane back and forth. Nothing like dying and killing the most important people in the MMA business because of a neck crank. Eventually, the Fertitas stepped in and separated the two, forcing them to sit on opposite sides of the plane for the remainder of the trip. Ortiz called the incident fun in a follow-up interview that MMA Junkie did after White revealed the story. I'm not sure if that means it wasn't as violent as White claimed, but this wouldn't be the first time that Dana and Tito didn't see things eye to eye. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Huge shout out to Max Randall for editing this video together. Follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.